Let's see, we have one person joining me right now. Welcome. So, thank you for coming on. Let's see, another person's joined in. So, it's going to be a canoe ride up the Mullica. Unfortunately, weather does not seem to want to play with us very nicely. So, um, it's it's not safe, uh, and number one rule when going out in the field is safety. Um, oh, I think we lost one person. Oh well, didn't want to for the, for the canoe. Anyways, um, so what we're going to do today is a briefer tour of an Atlantic white cedar swamp, um, and I somewhere on Stockton's campus. Um, for those of you that, and I apologize for the shakiness of the video here, I don't have the gimbal with me this time and I don't want to take an expensive piece of electronic other than my phone, which is new. Uh, one of the unique features of Stockton is that we have 1,600 acres of Pine Barrens property. Uh, it's managed, it's, it's conserved, we can't develop it, there's very strict rules, and so it's it's there for forever as far as we're concerned. Uh, but from an environmental science perspective, it's fantastic, because we can play around in it. We have all sorts of different ecosystems um, in the Pine Barrens. It is, like I've said in my previous streams, a fantastic place to study ecology. And uh, it is unique organisms that tend not to exist anywhere else. And if they do, this isn't their optimal range. And so uh, the Pine Barrens, uh, and there, there's several different Pine Barrens on the board. The Pine Barrens is just home to some crazy cool uh, organisms. Um, and what I'm going to do for you today is take you into one of the most unique Atlantic White Cedar Swamp. So to those of you that just joined on, um, welcome. Thanks for coming on. Uh, unfortunately, because it's a little rainy out, we can't go uh, kayaking or canoeing today. Um, I'm going to try to do it on Monday. and But uh, not safe. A little worried about lightning. Um, although I don't hear any or see any in the distance. It's always not a great idea to go into an open body of water during any time where it's raining. Um, and so what I'm going to do is just take a detour and do uh, Atlantic White Cedar Swamp. Um, I'll certainly come back here at some other time for another uh, live stream because cedar swamps change greatly throughout the year. Uh, so what I'm doing right now is I'm walking along Stockton's property. Uh, you can see that we're passing on the southern part of campus. Um, and uh, kind of desolate right now. Not not because of the virus, but because school's not in session. And um, it's... Uh, Hold me here. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna uh, meander into the forest at this point. Now you can see that this forest is really. really back. Um, sorry for the glitchy video. Hopefully my uh, my video doesn't cut out this time because it is a new phone. But who knows? I am working off of a 4G connection. Gail, thanks for the comment. Um, great. I hope that you. Uh, that you get to come into uh, Stockton and enjoy some of our property. It's it's, it's open to the public. You leave it the same way that you found it. Um, we welcome all kinds of people to come on in. So, where, um, oh, so Gail asked, where am I specifically? Um, so, I am actually on the southern part of campus. If you, uh, if you. Um, Take a look at campus and take a look at the parking lots on the southern part by anything on the western side of the property. And there's a really nice little trail that you can look at. And I think that Stockton posts some of the trails. Not too hard to find. Um, if you're interested, uh, send me a message uh, on Facebook and I will do my best to post. In any case, so uh, when I first got to New Jersey, I tell you, I really had no idea what kind of stuff was in the Pine Barrens. 
Um, and then uh, a friend of mine took me into it. This was my first thought was, oh my God, I just walked into the Black Forest from The Princess Bride, if anybody gets that reference. Because this is really just one of the darkest parts of the forest, but also one of the most magical, I think. So we're walking along a bridge right now. Uh, obviously, uh, and this bridge was set on top of the cedar swamp, so it's a great place for classes to come to study the Pine Barren. The southern uh, trails on Stockton's campus, and there's a large portion of Stockton's campus which actually doesn't have many trails on it, and so I don't recommend that you uh, go without uh, some kind of GPS unit. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just move across here, and uh, it's a shame that I can't really zoom out. But um, what you're seeing right now is true, true cedar swamp. Now, cedar swamp, as its name implies, is a swamp with many cedars. Right now, I'll swamp in a second, but this is the classic cedar tree you can see. Um, lots of lichen kind of covering it. It's relatively, um, I mean, compared to oak, it's smooth. It's got normal ridges on it that kind of swirl up the tree. And if you're looking at it from a distance, it looks relatively smooth. And cedars are just absolutely tall and straight, reaching up to the canopy, struggling with their neighbors to find them. Um, and then the roots in this really swampy area. It's a very acidic area. Um, there's a lot of sphagnum moss that loves growing it's acidic. Oh, what's that? I'm gonna have to go check that out. It's like a floating plant or something. Now, you can see the density of trees in this place is amazing. And that is one of the features of a swamp. All right, a swamp, unlike a marsh, a swamp is an area, it's a wetland. They're all wetlands. There's over, I think, three dozen or four dozen types of wetlands that the EPA defines. A swamp is a specific category wetland that um, has it growing from it. Hi, Gina, welcome. Has trees growing from it. And uh, it's a dark, closed canopied system. In contrast, a marsh is an open canopy system with much lower vegetation. And so when somebody says a swamp versus a marsh, a marsh is an open canopied system, a swamp is a closed canopied system. No sound. Um, Somebody just said that there is no sound. I think that it may be a problem on your end because uh, other people seem to be hearing me. If there is a problem with sound, other people, please. Um, but you may have it on mute. All right. So um, it looks like we have 21 people. Welcome. I hope that everybody's enjoying just a, an outing into a Stockton Cedar Swamp. Uh, was kind of preventing me from doing that. Um, let's just see. I'm going to write a comment here. Uh, tell me if the sound is sound is not working. I might also have had my finger over top. Uh, you know what? I think I might have had my finger on top of the microphone on this new. So a swamp, as I was saying, is a closed canopied wetland. Um, very dark on the understory, very specific plants on the understory that are adapted for that kind of system. And then marsh is a system with plants that are adapted to high sunlight. Now, within marshes, you have um, different types of marshes. You can have nutrient-rich marshes. You can have nutrient-poor marshes. You can have flowing 
Yes, yes, um, oh, thank you for telling me that you can hear me. I appreciate that. Um, so, and then within swamps, you have things like um, uh, uh, bogs and fens, but they can actually, bogs and fens, for example, can also be marshes about being canopied. Everything is kind of a uh, continuum. You know, humans love to categorize things, but nature doesn't really obey categories. And that's one thing I always try to teach my students is that nature, nature doesn't categorize anything. We just try to. So uh, uh, this land is um, actually pretty large on Stockton's campus, and we go to great efforts to protect it. Um, and one of the reasons to protect an Atlantic white cedar swamp is You will have to take dollars and, and, and use it for, for, for conservation. One of the really important reasons to preserve Atlantic white cedar swamps is, one, they provide an important fire break. There are fires. An Atlantic white cedar swamp provides a isolated habitat for organisms to retreat into where it will not burn as intensely. You can see that there's quite a bit of land here. Well, when the organisms find shelter, they can find shelter in a swamp such as this. Now, Atlantic white cedar swamps also provide extraordinarily valuable habitat for um, species that can live elsewhere, but they do prefer to live in this marshy habitat because it is closed canopied, because there aren't a lot of predators that can easily see them from above and sort of ground birds. But, um, you know, one thing that you're not seeing is a lot of, uh, Lorianne asks, does this marsh connect to Lake Fred or Lake Pam? Absolutely, it does. In fact, one of the things that defines this Atlantic white swamp, um, and I'm just walking along the bridge for right now, and I'll walk into the swamp in a little bit. Um, but there, the, the water over here is flowing. And the water does flow straight out into Lake Fred. Now, the same reasons for preserving an Atlantic white cedar swamp is that it is an important system for a wide variety of organisms that find shelter in here, that exist in here, they prefer to live in here, but also Atlantic white cedar filters water. We normally think of Brita as filtering water, but that's at your sink. That's at your tap. Nature has water filtration. And also, swamps, we would spend billions and billions of dollars more in purifying our water. This swamp looks beautiful. And it's beautiful is because of all of the vegetation. And the vegetation is holding up all of those minerals and tannins and taking them out of the water before it hits Lake Fred. Lake Fred would be a whole lot dirtier if it weren't for the fact that all of this water flows through the system. Now, of course, another reason to preserve Atlantic white cedar swamps that we don't want to think about anymore, probably many of us don't want to, is the value of cedar timber. Um, one of the reasons why Atlantic white cedar swamps are so um, rare Nowadays, you can get a lot of cedar trees because the timber is valuable. It's resistant to rot. It was used in boats, and uh, it was used in houses. It smells wonderful. Uh, it's used in all kinds of specialty woodworking. And unfortunately, we when we are we still harvest some cedar wood in controlled conditions because it is a valuable timber and of course we use nature just as much as we use nature and we can use the timber as long as we use it in a very so thank you to all of those who are joining on. I appreciate the company on this dreary Friday. Um, I apologize if the video is a little glitchy. I am working off of a 4G connection. It's one of those uh, things about just live streaming away from an internet connection. I'm on about the center of the campus on the western side, um, exploring a white cedar swamp. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to say if anybody has any questions or if you want me to search for anything, by all means.
means let me know. Um, if it cuts out for any reason, just let me know. I'm going to jump over uh, this fence here and just start exploring a little bit of this. I have my muck boots on, my ever important muck boots. By the way, if you want to do this, invest in a quality. Or something, and I swear it's a great investment. If you're cheap and you want to get something 20 bucks from Walmart, I got to tell you, they only last for a couple of years. All right, how long is that bridge? Well, <laughs> it's back and forth. It's not, not very long. Uh, oh, I don't know, maybe maybe one twentieth of a <laughs> kilometer. It's not very long. But they maintain it. It is clearly in pretty good condition. Maybe a few of the rail. It's a very valuable part of Stockton's um, um, uh, campus. How is cedar harvesting uh, being controlled, Gail? I don't, you know what? I don't actually know. And if there's anybody who knows on this uh, live stream, please, please chime in. I don't know things. Um, and uh, I do know that it is regulated such that you can't just chop down things in forested areas without a permit. But if you get that permit now, um, certainly you can. Um, I don't know how the Forestry Service regulates that, though. All right. So what uh, we're staring at on the ground here is an awful lot of sphagnum moss. This is the most. Um, uh, Atlantic white cedar swamps next to cedar trees. This sphagnum moss. This sphagnum moss is really um, adapted for acidic conditions, and it's extremely. It, it generates its own acidity, and the reason is because it has a tremendous amount of tannins. Now, I mentioned previously, I'm curious about this water. Uh, Atlantic white cedar swamp water is actually not that bad for you to drink because it's so acidic. It takes a lot of bacteria out of the water. Now, I'm not saying that you should shovel a whole bunch of cedar swamp water into your mouth because you will get sick. However, one thing that you can do is just take a handful of particles, but all of that water draining out. Is probably pretty good to drink. Now, I, have, I can't say I have personally done it, but uh, if you are aware without water and you really need some, cedar swamp water is actually not the worst option for you. Now, another thing to point out right here, uh, I don't know how well you guys can see it, but on top of this uh, water right here, you can see all those little yellow... Um, uh, splashes of so pollen, and if anybody has you know, pollen season in maples and um, other trees are releasing their pollen right now, and maybe you haven't thought about it, but, but that pollen is really, really important because it's a nutrient-rich source of inputs to this swamp, and in the swamp, things are really best. All right, so I'm really getting into some marshy conditions right here, um, and I don't have <laughs> great protection for my phone, so I am going to be very careful here. Um, thank all of you who are joining on. I appreciate you being here and accompanying me. Um, so um, some other trees that are really characteristic of cedar swamps are black gum. I'm oh, sorry, I thought I saw a snake. Nope. Black gum, um, Just cut out there for a second. Let's 
see that I have a few people joining back on. Sorry about that, guys. I don't know exactly what happened. Yeah, All right. Sorry about that. I appreciate you coming back on. I'm going to wait for a few more people to show up. We had about 10 or 12 people on. So um, in the meantime, while we're waiting for people to come on, just feel free to chat in your personal experiences. I certainly don't know a whole lot about them. I'm much more of a um, marsh ecosystem guy um, in my research, and I study um, a variety of other ecosystems. But being familiar with it, so just feel free to chat me um, some interesting snippets of information that you might know. Anything that I can share with other people, make this an educational experience. Anything that you guys would like me to see, more than happy to. I hear some uh, tree frogs calling in the distance. I don't know if you guys can hear that. Not pine barrens tree frogs. Those are most likely either copes or gray tree frog. But um, that's that's that. That. So just waiting for a few more people to come back on. Got six people on right now. Looks like we've got a bird box up there. I wonder if anybody's home. Uh, you can see that this cedar swamp really extends pretty far. One of the other really valuable things about cedar swamps is just the immense amount of carbon that they store. And I know that... Um, if you haven't really been trying to, but when we're trying to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, one thing that forests are really important for is sucking all of that CO2 out of the atmosphere. Trees suck it out of the atmosphere and store it in the form of a tree. They store it in the form of all of this bark right here. They literally take atmospheric oxygen, uh, atmosphere and water and suck that co2 it is one of the most valuable things that we could do because we need to reduce co2 pollution in our atmosphere to a manageable level to a level that is um, sustainable for human existence yes uh karen johnson this the uh it was frozen i apologize for that we are back thank you for coming on back So as I said before, um, some of the, some of the um, other tree species that battle it out for dominance in a cedar swamp next to cedars are um, are uh, uh, black gum, Nyssa sylvatica, as well as red maple, Asa rubrum. Those are two of the most important species conservation-wise because without proper management and fire burning and deer management, Gum will gain dominance fairly quickly. Um, the reason is because deer come on in and they will graze down cedar pretty readily. Um, and they'll leave behind some of this black gum. And they'll also leave behind some of the red maple. And red maple will gain dominance fairly quickly. And they're better competitors than cedar. Cedar will not do well in the presence of it loves these conditions, these swampy conditions. This is one of those spots where red maple truly does shine. And so it is really important that we cut down the deer population to a manageable level. It is also really important that we um, try to make sure that we burn our forests as much as possible, that we manage those burns in a way that's sustainable for humans. Um, and white cedar swamps do burn a little bit, not nearly as intensely as other ecosystems in the Pine Barrens, but they can. Um, and uh, it's just really important that we uh, figure out ways of sustainably managing the system. It keeps it around for a while. Now, I am looking around. Hi, Susan. Thanks for coming back on. Um, uh, I am looking around for some carnivorous plants, and I we got um, sundew right here. Oh, not yeah. There we go. Some sundew right here. Now this sundew, it looks very different from the sundew that we saw before. It's not red, and the reason it's not red is because it's under shade. Um, uh, carnivorous plants will, like many other plants, when there's high amounts of sunlight, 
blue spot. These are things that protect it from high amounts of ultraviolet radiation. And these, um, these carnivorous plants uh, don't need that protection because we're in a cedar swamp. Now this is uh, Drosera, probably rotundifolia, uh, maybe intermedia. I need my, my um, I need Josh here to, to, to tell me exactly, but I'm pretty sure it's rotundifolia. Um, and they're all over the place. Once I look for them, I can find them now. I see other two species, uh, Intermedia and Philoformis here, and I don't think that we're going to see any pitcher plants, although I can certainly walk in and see if I can find any. Um, I don't know why we wouldn't see any pitcher plants. This is probably a pretty good area for it. Thanks to those of you who are joining back on. I appreciate it. And again, if you have any interesting things to tell the audience about, I'm not an expert in anything. Just because I teach at a university doesn't make me smart. It just makes me the most willing to tell people that I don't know everything. So if you have anything that you'd like to share, please let me know. Um, you be the teacher. Just taking you guys out for a stroll. Side of the video is working off of a 4G connection. Now you can see how far back this goes. Um, really, just a very, very, very nice system. I tell students whenever I'm in here, I'm a, I'm a hummock humper. And you, you heard that, right? I'm a hummock humper. All of these things right here, these are hummocks. Little patches. Is a roof thing that, um, I can uh, jump on and save myself from sinking. Uh, Karen asks, Karen asks, how large is the swamp? And I actually don't know the acreage on here. It occupies a fairly large strip of Stockton's land. I'm going to guess probably the swamp proper proper is somewhere around 30, 40, maybe 50 acres of land. But it's there's not a real clear delineation of where anybody that knows better than me, please let me know. Um, now, you can actually walk through, and I don't recommend that people just take a, a jaunt uh, off I'm very good at handling myself in swampy conditions. Of course, if you are as well, please do, but also know your own limitations. Yeah, Karen, it is probably that it is probably that large that large. Something I just disturbed something. Probably that we don't. That it's probably one of the only parts on campus that is this kind of uh, cedar swamp, um, and we really do work very hard at maintaining it. We have some excellent um, foresters, uh, Dr. Matthew Olson, uh, and our previous George Zimmerman. There's a spider web right here. Um, and they really did um, really write the book on uh, Atlantic White Cedar Swamps and their importance and demonstrated to the community why it's so important, especially on Stockton's campus. Oh my goodness, we have 28, 29 people. Chrissy's watching. Hi, Chrissy. Come on in. Oh, thank you to all of you joining me. This That's a really great crowd. I truly appreciate it. Um, so those who don't expected a canoe ride. However, we are not on a canoe ride because it is raining, and that's dangerous. Um, and so uh, we are instead taking a slow jaunt through an Atlantic. I'm on my phone in the water here. Um, I am literally stepping into Cedar Swamp right now and hoping that it's not too deep. Uh, muck boots. Uh, on campus, one of the most unique features of Stockton's campus, in my opinion. Now, I think it is raining, but f raining pretty hard. But fortunately, we're under high canopy cover. Oh, 34 people! Thank. How many other carnivorous plants? We have a whole patch of them right here. Um, again, just a, a really great habitat for carnivorous plants. And one of the things that I mentioned about carnivorous plants on the last live stream. 
they are for the ecosystem, even though they're really tiny, they have a high, high abundance. And the reason why they're so important is because, remember, this place is very nutrient-poor. A nutrient-poor ecosystem needs to get the into it. And those carnivorous plants eat bugs from the atmosphere, and those bugs get digested, and the plant will eventually die, which means that the bugs soil and the soil becomes nitrogen and phosphorus rich because of those carnivorous plants oh man I'm just stepping on carnivorous plants here all over the place Sometimes. If there's anything that anybody wants me to go where it wants me to go to uh, wants me to Otherwise, I'm just going to make sure I don't drop my phone and sink. Now, you can see we have a little thing ready to up. All right. They're not. Um, they're not because we have a whole bunch of cedars in the upper canopy. Um, but as soon as one of those cedars fall, those little tiny maple seedlings are just going to shoot straight up. Uh, which is why it's really important that we manage the amount of cedars in here to make sure that those... Is that a black gum? I'm not sure. We have a few black gum seedlings here too. Now black gums are... Um, they're leaf... They're leaf leaf are extremely acidic. Um, and they, they do a great job of turning the water very, very black. Any Stockton alum watching, give a shout out. Any uh, uh, friends watching, give a shout out. Um, congratulations to you. I know it wasn't exactly the uh, the uh, graduation ceremony that you had dreamed of, or maybe it was. I don't know, but uh, it's the best that we could do given some very strange times. One of the things I love about the fact that um, is, is the fact that no matter what seems to be happening in the human world, um, there are still there's still nature, right? Nature. There are poison, poison ivy in the swamp. Um, you know, I don't think that there's that much. I haven't seen any, um, really. Uh, I will preface that with, I'm not actually allergic, so I don't usually care. <laughs> I'm not a friend cater, uh, because when I'm leading students into places that might have it, most people are allergic to it, and so I have to be very cognizant of it. Um, however, uh, I'm not allergic to it, so I'm not typically watching out. Um, I think that this is bracken fern, although I could be wrong. Just a young bracken fern. Um, if there is any poison um, spaces here and there, and it's going to be very small, I certainly haven't seen any large patches of it um, like there, like there usually is. Oh my goodness, Deborah is an environmental science major of 73. Welcome on. Thank you for tuning in, Deborah. Much appreciated. I hope that you're enjoying yourself, and if there's anything that you would like to add to this, please do let me know. Man, that was before I was born, Deborah. <laughs> well, I'm really glad that we can connect. We can connect you to what's happening. Yeah, we can do that. Oh, check this out. <clears throat> well, it wasn't from a dog. Sound. Keep in touch with Deborah. I apologize. Um, it's just a matter of working in a 4G connection. So I don't know what this bone is from, but I'm going to guess a deer. Um, it's fairly large. Uh, if anybody knows a bit better, let me know. Um, Deborah, also, you can also 
end of the I'm going to live stream afterwards. It should be better uh, when the video is posted on Facebook. You can just rewatch it afterwards. And Deborah says, ouch, yeah. Yeah, they didn't like getting eaten. However, that is really, really important. I don't know why I'm still holding on to it. I'm going to lay it back down. Really, really important. And actually, let's talk about this bone is going to stay here for a while. This bone has an enormous amount of phosphorus in it. And that bone, when it decomposes slowly over time, it's like a slow leaching of phosphorus into a system that really, really does need it. All right, I have to admit, I have to admit I'm meandering. So I'm going to start making my way back uh, in the hopes that I find that bridge again. Wouldn't be the first time I got myself stuck in mud. For those of you that don't know, I'm an assistant professor here at Stockton. Oh man, look at all these sundews. Um, assistant professor here at Stockton. Uh, um, specifically, I focus on freshwater ecosystems, but now I'm actually studying red maple um, and maple syrup production. We got a grant from the USDA um, to uh, red maple research from maple. Um, so we're, we're doing that, switching gears, and that's one of the things I love about science and working at a university is that if I get bored of one thing, I just switch to something else. And um, not that I ever really get bored of it once in a while. Um, I will say a swamp and a marsh will always be my home. Tech Trek girls, I don't know what those are. Sounds I am I am. Man, I am sincerely hoping that that is not too deep. Okay, not doing that then. Gonna meander my way back. Now, like any true um, ecologist worth his field expertise, I have a pretty good sense of where I am. And at the very least, I know if I walk in this particular direction, I'm going to get back to a very specific trail. Um, I just don't know where on that trail I'm going to get to. Um, another uh, aspect of decomposition, because system, take a look at all of this. All of that is just cedar needles or cedar stems. All of that stuff is just decomposing very slowly as well. Also providing great habitat for insects and amphibians. And by the way, the amphibians that we have, of course, we have wood frogs and spring peepers. We also have, uh, I think, cricket frogs, chorus frogs. Um, could be wrong about those two. Uh, carpenter frogs, leopard frogs, um, four-toed salamanders. Um, Eli's watching. Hi, Eli. How you doing? Yeah. All right. Now I'm on the edge of it. You can see that things are a little bit less mucky and the forest transitions to far less sphagnum moss. So, my range is about. about. Um. <laughs> Anybody is interested in hiking where I'm hiking. A lot of non-native species in pine barren swamps. Um, that seems to be invading everywhere, um, although I don't see a ton of it. Um, we certainly have um, some species that are encroaching upon it, like black gum and um, uh, maple. Um, we're going to be here. Oh, no. 
if you know any more, please let me know. Like I said, I'm not an expert. Don't mind embarrassing myself by rambling on about things that I barely know anything about. I tell my students, you become a scientist when you can detect the 5% of things that come out of my mouth that I actually do know. The rest is just BS. But, you know. I'm doing fine. Thanks for asking. Hope you uh, figured out your job situation. Thankfully, it seems to be lessening. Some glimmer of hope. All right, coming out of this thing. Hopefully, people aren't stupid. They don't cough on other people. I never have a lot of faith in humanity when it comes to those things. But I tell you what, you come out here, there's nobody for miles. That's social distancing. Whether you like it or not. I'll take a look at that lichen. Oh, and some more carnivorous plants. Just a ton of them. So small, yet so important. Oh, I found the bridge. Look at that. See, I know where I am. <laughs> Maybe. As a teacher, I have to I have to say sometimes I I come out here and I get really frustrated in thinking about all of the students that walk past this system and don't think about it at all because they just don't appreciate it. They just don't know why it's so important. Let's, um, while I, while I still have a connection, let's walk out to some of the burn plots here and just see them. We, we heavily burned one of the experimental plots out here before. Let's see if I can find it. Check a look at that pitch pine. Oh man, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I am wearing muck boots without socks. And for those of you that have ever done that before, you know that my feet are in a little bit of pain right now. Yeah, here we go. So not too far away from this, you keep on hiking down the trail. And by the way, if you follow this trail, you're going to get to um, the satellite lots, um, I believe what they're 9 and 10, near our um, uh, astronomy, um, uh, oh, I'm losing words, um, oh, the old parking lots by the fields. Anyways, all right, so here's a burn plot. That doesn't look a lot like a burn plot right now. <laughs> Uh, because there's so much vegetation coming back up, but uh, this was burned a couple years back um, And you can see all the blueberry coming up uh, There's some bracken fern. I can see that right now uh, For Chrissy's sake. I'm gonna see if I can't find any uh, um, 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 uh, Pink lady slippers, there's bracken fern right there You know, I make wine, and I keep on trying to get out here before the birds do to get blueberries. Because blueberry wine made from uh, naturally grown blueberries, not stuff that's like bulked up with uh, fertilizer, is delicious. But I can't seem to beat the birds. Check out this spider web right here. So I love these, this spider web. I don't know if you can see it. 
Um, but this is a, a unique type of spider web that they weave it around the, the ends of twigs like this to catch any debris and insects that are falling down. Thanks, Susan. I appreciate you feeling my pain. It's all right. Nothing beats this past summer. No, yeah, this past summer, not this summer, this past summer. I know Eli will uh, remember this. When I was, uh, we did one of our first lakes where I was sampling for microplastics, and geez, I was in waders, and I was literally carrying a boat through a mile of swamp, and I still have blisters on my heels from that. Oh, I was in Make Peace Lake, if anybody knows where that is. That is neither a peaceful lake or a lake, to be honest with you. More of a marsh. By the way, a lake is more defined as something where there is, um, uh, there's no emergent vegetation. Greg says, check out Martha Furnace if you want tons of wild blueberries. 20 minutes from Galloway. All right, will do. Still think the birds are going to get it before I do. If anybody knows where I can find elderberries, let me know too. I all love making elderberry wine, but I can't find. There's one patch of elderberry that I found, and it's not enough. But if I can find some natural elderberries somewhere, oh my god. I will gladly give you a couple bottles of wine in exchange for that knowledge. So guys, I don't know if you can see it, but we are coming out onto a plot of land that was severely burned. Um, well, not severely burned, sorry. It was burned very recently, and you can see the change right here. Take a look at that. That is a gorgeous photo op right there. Take a look at that change, left and right, burned and not burned, all right? Absolutely amazing. Now, I know I don't have a photo pinned on me, guys, but I can tell you right now I am smiling because this is just a gorgeous, gorgeous piece of ecology right here. And I don't know if you can see it, but off in the distance, there's the uh, satellite lots. If you just, I guess we'll walk to it. What's the difference? My ankles are already hurting me. <laughs> Got nothing else going on today. So, might as well go for a nice jaunt through the woods. Feel free to ask any questions. If you want me to show you anything, please let me know. And you can clearly see that this area was burned. Uh, very recent burn scars. I'll show it to you. Oh man. Oh, this is still connected. I don't know what that's from. Probably another deer. Check that out. All right. I mean, that's some serious burning right there. And then you can see here as well, some serious burning. Um, now, of course, these pitch pines, they don't burn inside. It's just the outer layer that burns. Um, Eli asked, are they going to be burning this year? Eli, they already burned. Um, they usually burn in March and April uh, when the weather is colder and there's less risk of any... Um, accidents from embers going off someplace. So they already burned. And I'll show you something else. I learned this when I was talking with Dr. Olson. Um, so you can see these, these blacker patches right here. Apparently these are laurels. Um, and whenever you see these black, black patches, um, those are uh, laurels, and laurels apparently have a lot of um, um, oils in their leaves that turn hotter, uh, and so you can tend to see uh, patches where laurels have come in, and that's a species that is rapidly encroaching. It's not invasive, per se, but it's, um, it grows kind of when there's, there's not a lot of burning going on. Haven't seen any bright flashes of pink anywhere, so, you know, I'm not seeing any of those pink lady slippers. But, don't lose hope. Alright, guys.
guys. I think I'm just going to walk to the end of this trail and then walk on back. And you can see it again across this, across the way. There's another patch of land where they have uh, they have burned uh, maybe three or four years ago, and it's come back. We're actually at a. Um, oh, you know what? I don't actually know where we are on Stockton's campus. I get all turned around. Anyways, I'm turning back. Oh, check out that burn! I completely missed it. Look at that old dead tree. 28 people. Thank you all for showing up. It really means a lot to me. Love hanging out with uh, people in the forest. It's sad that we can't necessarily do it during these uh, strange times, but I'm so glad that people can join in. If you're not from Jersey, if you're hanging out somewhere else, let me know. I'm interested to know where people are tuning in from. Man, I'll tell you, that Make Peace Lake, oh my goodness, my heels were bleeding after that. So what happened, just for those of you that are curious, I, I do some work where we're looking for microplastics in lakes around New Jersey. I got a grant from the state to survey microplastic contamination all throughout New Jersey and freshwater lakes, and Make Peace Lake was one of the first lakes that we tried to do. That's a wildlife management area uh, close to Stockton University. Um, and looked at it on a map, seemed like it was fine, but man, we went out there with the John boat and the motor died. Not that the motor was any good anyway, because uh, I neglected to realize that it was a, an abandoned cranberry bog and um, had a whole bunch of downed wood and weeds and uh, the motor we got tangled every instance anyway. And we, uh, like a true ecologist, I, I told my students, we, we have got to take these samples. I'm not going back until we take these samples. And that was a mistake because um, that boat wouldn't move anywhere. And so I just hopped out of the boat in waders. It was only about three feet deep. Hopped out of the boat in waders and started pulling on the boat. Well, I got to tell you, walking in Make Peace Lake, even with waders, not very easy because that lake is so cluttered on the bottom with logs and vegetation that I could only take a couple of steps. I had to drink like two gallons of water that day and I swear to God, I was hauling the boat with a rope. I had two students on board who were really sure that I was gonna die. I was a little uncertain of it myself, I gotta admit. We finally got back to shore and I just collapsed, but we got the samples. That's the important thing. I'll tell you, when I was an undergraduate, when I was an undergraduate, uh, I was doing some stream work. And I'll never forget that um, I was doing stream work in the middle of winter in a state forest and uh, I drove my old car, which is a Buick Century, I drove my old car um, out into the out into um, the state forest and I swear the asphalt stopped and the ice started and I just thought to myself, well I made it this far and I'm not turning around so I started driving, there was a ravine on one side and the forest on the left and I still drove, got to the site with the stream, um, hacked my way through ice to get to the sample, came back, my foot was completely frozen, not to the point of uh, frostbite or anything, but pretty cold to the point where I couldn't actually determine if I was stepping on the uh, gas pedal or not because it was still warming up. You know that feeling when your feet get really, really cold? Um, and I uh, finally managed to get myself to get the heater on uh, and get myself out of that forest. It was, took me about two and a half hours and I got back to the lab and I started telling my advisor at the time about this and my advisor said, um, did you get the samples? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I got the samples, and he said, then stop complaining. And uh, from that day on, I knew what an ecologist was. And um, I'm proud. 
Samples came first that day. Our sanity was left in the lake. Indeed, indeed, Eli. And you can see I'm entering back into Cedar Swamp area um, where it's getting to be far more piney, a lot more pitch pine, and a lot more cedars kind of mixed in. We have some maples, um, some black gums. This is a black gum right here. Oh, that's a bad picture. Let's see if I can find a better black gum. I believe that this is a black gum um, right here. Um, black gum and um, well, there's a bridge. Chrissy says I grew up not that far from Make Peace. It is a beautiful lake, and you know what? If I were to go out there on a canoe or a kayak, it would be an absolutely beautiful time. Great for fishing. I can just imagine going for a picnic around that lake. Absolutely gorgeous. But that's not what we did. Deborah asks, were there microplastics in my samples? Funny you should ask that, Deborah. No. Uh, and yes. Um, so in Make Peace Lake, I haven't analyzed that lake yet. Um, we uh, had a devil of a time trying to figure out how to run those samples uh, for microplastics because I was sort of inventing new methodology. Um, and in a lot of the rural samples that we're that I'm analyzing, um, we're not finding a whole lot of microplastics, but in some a ton. Um, even right here, we're likely to find some microplastics, as is evident from the cigar wrapper that is probably deteriorating. Um, so, yeah, we're finding some bits of plastic here and there, but not a lot, thankfully. Um, although I haven't analyzed the surface waters yet, um, I still have those samples to go through. I would be much farther on it except two things. Uh, one, um, uh, the virus happened, and I uh, lost a whole bunch of labor right in the middle of the semester, so sorry about that. Can't get it done. And two, I really couldn't get the methodology down. Sharon asked, was it a Jersey Devil of a time? Absolutely a Jersey Devil of a time. Although I have to tell you, not quite as a Jersey Devil of a time as the time when I sampled the Blue Hole Lake in the middle of Hamilton. Man, that lake is right in the middle of a quarry, and I don't know how we got to it, but it was a cool system. And I swear they said it was where the Jersey Devil lives. I believe them. All right, folks. Well, I think I'm going to cut it out pretty soon here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk back out on campus and I'm going to show you where the trailhead is in case anybody wants to uh, responsibly take a trail through here. Please, please, please make sure that you tell somebody where you're going and don't veer too far off the trail. If you do, just bring your GPS and make sure you know where you are. Bring some muck boots and bring uh, some bug spray. And uh, next week we are um, hopefully, weather permitting, we are going to go around with uh, Mr. Greg Fisher, who is uh, on the stream right now. We are going to um, sample some lakes uh, for what we call abiotic properties, so pH and um, conductivity. He is doing a project where we're looking at suitable habitats for um, pine barrens tree frogs. Uh, so he's going to put out some recorders and we're going to talk about that methodology and talk about the Pine Barrens tree frog. So join us next week for that. And uh, maybe I'll get out on Monday and take my phone out with me and do a live stream of um, kayaking or canoeing along Tom's River. See what we can do. So you can see that there's this retaining wall right here. Um, and they, uh, they built this retaining wall up because they wanted to build the parking lot um, up higher.
I've also arranged a set of live streams for the month of June. Very excited to be uh, touring the greenhouse and our uh, innovative aquifer thermal exchange system on Stockton's campus. Also looking at our organic farm. If anybody has any ideas for live streams, just let me know. So for those of you that would like to come on out here, I'll just show you sort of where you are. Um, we are, uh, so the lower parking lots uh, where all of the um, solar panel bays are. Uh, these are the lower campus dorms. I believe they're the freshman dorms. Um, and so if you just kind of come on out here and meander um, into the forest, you should be able to find the trail, no problem. Um, just look for these log, these large bays. Um, if you look at an aerial image, uh, shouldn't have too much of a problem finding it. Joe asks, are you seeing uh, any red maple samaras? Yeah, Joe, what the heck are you talking about? I don't know what a red maple samara is. <laughs> Never heard of it. And Joe, hi. Didn't know you were watching. Thanks for watching. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to sign on off. Joe, email me and let me know what a samara is. I'm going to sign on off here and uh, hope to see you all next week. Oh, Lot 7, Greg says. Thank you, Greg.